Okay, WC3 students, we're back to uh, conclude the viral lecture. So let's start here with where I said we'll talk a little bit about miscellaneous things, kind of not in the categories that, you know, I try to divide it up into DNA and RNA viruses. This is just all inclusive, just to give you an overview, okay? So let me just go over, um, this is miscellaneous. This is H1N1, you guys are pretty familiar with H1N1, swine flu, bird flu. It's influenza virus that every fall we usually get vaccinated, from, uh, vaccinated with. So let's look at the H part of the H1N1, hemagglutinin, uh, that's the H. It's a receptor. This H receptor allows the virus to hook itself into uh, the host respiratory cells. So this virus has um, something we call uh, hemagglutinin that will allow it to hook its into the host uh, respiratory cells. Now the N part of this is neuraminidase. That's the N. This is also a receptor, but this time uh, the virus can fuse with the host cell. So at first with the H, you can hook into the host cell, but now with the N, you get to fuse into the host cell. These receptors, the H and the N, are genetically controlled and they're subject to frequent changes uh, in structure. The receptors, the H and the N, are assigned numbers to keep track of the several different forms of the virus. So in this case, it's an H1 and N1. So apparently that means it was the first uh, time we had seen that particular strand of influenza virus. I think I mentioned to you before that uh, you know, this is an RNA virus. RNA viruses are um, segmented or can be segmented or non-segmented. This one happens to be segmented. So I'm just going to draw like a representation so that you can kind of see uh, the segments. Hope you can see the segments. So maybe you can name, number them one, two, three, four, five, six, and with that, the segments can uh, rearrange themselves. So here are the segments, for example, and two may come here instead of where one is, four may be there, one will come over here, five, then six will be here, and then three may be there. So they can continue to rearrange themselves as these segments until you just always have a new virus. That's why every fall there's some, it's a different vaccine because of the reassortment, reassortment and rearrangement of these um, segmented RNA viruses. So that was just to give you a little overview um, why some viruses um, have numbers associated with them and what the receptors are and how it really does get into our respiratory tract from our pharynx down to maybe our, in our trachea into our bronchioles and bronchia, uh, uh, um, bronchioles and bronchi, et cetera, and even all the way down to the uh, alveoli. So just keep that in mind. Another thing I think I mentioned to you about viruses um, being able to cause cancer, call that oncogenic. So here's just a few of the ones that um, I could come up with that viruses that cause, do indeed cause cancer. So let's look at the DNA viruses that we know are, um, can cause cancer. Epstein-Barr virus, this is the virus, Epstein-Barr virus, that can induce a cancer known as uh, Burkitt lymphoma, Burkitt's lymphoma. Usually though, that's, that's like a big, um, um, 
infiltration of a, the parotid gland, usually seen in children in um, like countries like, uh, in some countries in Africa, on the continent of Africa. Um, Epstein-Barr virus can indeed cause Burkitt's lymphoma, and that's usually seen like in the parotid glands in children in countries in Africa. I think this EBV, as we call it, can cause a, a nasopharyngeal kind of cancer in um, Asian uh, people, usually men, not children, usually men, and it's usually nasopharynx and not the uh, salivary gland, as in uh, the children. Here is human herpes virus, HHV8. That causes a Kaposi sarcoma, seen in uh, immunocompromised people, but more specifically, this is kind of, this is a rare kind of cancer, Kaposi, but not so rare in people that are afflicted with AIDS. This is where we see uh, this kind of cancer, uh, usually in patients um, that are afflicted with AIDS. It's kind of a purplish uh, discoloration of the skin, um, it looks like a really deep, deep kind of bruise and very, um, very distinctive. Once you see it, you'll, you'll recognize it um, again. Hepatitis B. Hepatitis B um, can cause hepatic carcinoma. So hepatitis B can indeed cause liver cancer. Certain papilloma viruses, that's the HPV, right? I think we went over HPV. HPV human papilloma virus. Usually, um, human papilloma virus 16 and 18. Those are the major ones that this that cause the cervical or penile uh, cancer. So <clears throat> you can see HPV, and that's usually now they have vaccine out for it. Um, and when women get pap smears, that's one of the big things they're checking is to see if there's something on the cervix when they do the cervical scraping that when they send it to the lab, is it coming back with HPV 16 or 18 that usually is the one, are the ones that could cause um, cervical cancer. And yes, I did say penile cancer, so um, boys and girls sh should both um, probably get the HPV vaccine if you're so inclined. Um, RNA viruses um, that could cause cancer or oncogenic links are retroviruses, of course, that's the causes uh, HIV, of course, the retrovirus. So HTLV1, it causes a T-cell leukemia. So you can get a T-cell leukemia from a retrovirus, um, a lot of oftentimes seen in people with um, HIV, and then here is hepatitis C, it causes liver cancer, um, but note that that's an RNA virus, hepatitis C, whereas hepatitis B is the only hepatitis that is a DNA virus. These are the only two of the hepatitises, if that's such a word, that can actually damage the liver to the point of causing uh, cirrhosis which is severe scarring of the liver, and that once the liver is scarred by cirrhosis, there's no going back. It doesn't like heal itself and become unscarred. Um, and that can go on to develop uh, a uh, cancer. So with that being said, let I know I promised you that I was gonna go over some of the, I was gonna go over the hepatitis, like I said, if that's a word. And so let me just um, go into that now. Let's see what is truly the um, differences with these. So we know we have hepatitis. A through E, so hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. Hepatitis A um, is an RNA virus, so this is the way it will look. 
if you see it on a test or anywhere else, hepatitis A virus, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C, D virus, hepatitis E virus, okay? Hepatitis A um, is an RNA virus. It's transmitted primarily by the fecal oral route. So typically we have some foodstuffs that has been contaminated by hepatitis A and then uh, we eat it and end up with this. Usually when you want to travel, especially outside of our country, um, you should get the vaccine for hepatitis A. If I'm traveling overseas, Although I haven't, uh, probably did that one time. I usually just go now, but <clears throat> try to be cautious about what I eat. Like I generally don't eat the street food, but that's usually the best food. Um, if you're going over to um, foreign countries, the street food is the best, but I try to caution against it. But hepatitis A um, is transmitted primarily through the fecal oral route, short incubation, about three weeks. You have no carriers. Um, but you do fortunately have a vaccine for that. Hepatitis B as well, we have a vaccine, thank goodness. Um, this is of course the only DNA hepatitis virus. Um, it's transmitted primarily through like IVs and injections sexually um, and sexual contact and maternal fetal uh, roots. So mom can give it to the fetus, right? Um, it's a long incubation period. Hepatitis A has short incubation period, like three weeks. This could go like three months. And you can have hepatitis B, can go like three months. And you can have carriers, like chronic. And you may not even know you have hepatitis. So uh, the other in interesting thing about this, this does have a reverse transcriptase uh, where it uses um, uh, in, uh, DNA uh, dependent. DNA polymerase to make more of itself. Fortunately, we have a vaccine for this, so um, and you have you should get that just on GP. You should get that, I, I think. So it does cause it, ha, it can cause cirrhosis, and of course, it can lead to uh, liver cancer. Hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is very similar to hepatitis B, but hepatitis C is transmitted via blood, when you get like blood transfusions, etc. cetera. Um, and it resembles uh, hepatitis B in its course and severity. You can definitely have carriers with hepatitis C. Um, it's a common cause of post transfusions and IV drug use and um, is, has a propensity to cause this type of seen with this type of spread in hepatitis. There's no vaccine for hepatitis C as of yet. Um, also can cause uh, cirrhosis or severe scarring of the liver. And also hepatitis C can cause uh, uh, cancer of the liver. Let's go to hepatitis D, D as in dog. Um, this means Delta agent. This is like a defective virus and it requires, and interestingly enough, it requires hepatitis B to even become infective, right? So it requires the envelope from hepatitis B uh, to become infective. So hepatitis D as in dog is dependent upon hepatitis B as in boy. Uh, there are carriers due to probably the, uh, uh, the hepatitis B being involved, but there's no vaccine for it. Hepatitis E as in egg E, we don't see this one in our country too much. Um, no, I don't think we see this in our country. This is transmitted enterically, so from the gut as well, and it causes and causes waterborne epidemics. So it resembles uh, hepatitis A in its course and severity, and also in its incubation, really short incubation period for hepatitis E, just like hepatitis A, three weeks about. High mortality, this is an interesting thing about hepatitis E. It has a high mortality in pregnant women. But we don't see that here in our country because uh, our sanitation is different. Um, you can treat with a gamma globulin if detected early enough, right? 
And sometimes, you, if you hear about viruses, um, viruses can respond to interferon and other antiviral agents, uh, other antiviral drugs. So I kind of wanted to go through those. Another way that I remember um, hepatitis uh, is that vowels, like A and E, I'll go through your bowels. So I always remember vowels, A and E, hepatitis, uh, go through your bowels. So that does have to do with water, food, or something that you take in enterically, right, through the gut. And hepatitis B and C are very similar in that they can cause uh, problems with the liver. So, and then you'll remember that hepatitis D is dependent upon hepatitis B. Okay, so that was the main thing with the hepatitis. Let's look at uh, the differences with, well, first of all, let's go over what viruses, um, killed viruses and attenuated viruses, right? So attenuated viruses, if you've probably seen this in your reading already, have to do with making the virus less virulent, really. You don't kill it, but you do kind of want to knock the oomph out of it, right? So it's weakened. The virus is weakened. So we could just say attenuated means weakened. It's not killed. Some viruses are killed, like um, I think the uh, one of the polio viruses, that's by Salk, is killed, but the Sabin polio virus is uh, attenuated or weakened. Rabies virus is probably killed because you don't want to get that sucker. So you don't want to get that. So an attenuated virus is a vaccine, an attenuated vaccine, attenuated vaccine is a vaccine that's created by reducing the virulence of the pathogen but still keeping it viable. So it's still alive, but we have significantly reduced its virulence, right? Attenuation takes an infectious agent and alters it. It changes it so that it becomes harmless or less virulent. So it's a weakened form of what it used to be. It's not as strong as it used to be, right? Inactivated viruses, these are the killed viruses, is a vaccine that is consisting of a virus particles um, and or other pathogens and have been grown in culture and then killed. The pathogens for inactivated vaccines are grown under controlled conditions and are killed as a means to reduce their infectious or their virulence and thus prevent the infection uh, from the vaccine. The virus is killed using a method such as heat or formaldehyde, okay? So I know some people say, oh, it's formaldehyde in my vaccine. It's uh, mercury in my vaccine. It's this in my vaccine. You know, those may be the methods that the, vac the virus was killed. It's not that it's put in there to um, harm you. And some vaccines too that are grown in like chick embryos um, if you have an allergic reaction to eggs, um, you would have to let the person that's getting the physician know that before you start to get um, your vaccine. So MMR, for example, that's grown in chick eggs. So you may want to let your doctor know if your child is allergic to eggs. So let's look at some live attenuated viruses. These are weakened viruses, right? We said that's what attenuated means. Uh, these are vaccines, live attenuated vaccines. So the measles virus, also known as rubiola virus, is one. Um, this is grown in the chick embryo cells. Then we have the German measles. Uh, virus. And that's called 
This is, I guess it's called Bubella virus. That is grown in the monkey kidney cells. So usually, like now, we're really concerned about getting this coronavirus um, vaccine. And it takes a long time to culture these cells, especially when they're grown inside of a medium, like live tissue, for example. People, some people are against that, but it really has helped protect us as hosts. But what they're working on now with this company called Moderna, they're working on a messenger RNA vaccine where they already know the genome, the, the genetic sequencing of the coronavirus. So they're going to take little pieces of it, like maybe the spikes that, you know, resemble crowns that come off the envelope of the virus and make a, a vaccine from it. Whatever, or maybe it's the envelope, but whatever it is, um, maybe it's the capsid, you know, I don't know, but they're going to look at it, the sequence of the, the genetic sequence of the coronavirus and then take, they could take bits and pieces out of it and then that messenger RNA and then they can just use that as something to use as a vaccine to help us fight it if our body sees that particular part of the coronavirus again. So that's, in that case, in that case, you don't have to grow these things in like uh, uh, chick embryos or monkey kidneys or, uh, or, you know, whatever. That's why it can be processed much quicker because in China, they already sent out the genomic sequence all over the world. And you have to remember, we have scientists from all over the world. It's the first time that I can recall that everybody in the world, all scientists that do that kind of work is working on this one thing at the same time, you know. So that's a unique thing to experience. And um, sure, everybody's saying, well, it's gonna come out too quickly. That's because of the method they're using, the messenger RNA to get this virus, the little sequences of it, the little pieces of it to see how they can use that to make our body have a response that we can fight it if we see it again, right? So right now, that's what the, the deal is. It's not that, and um, using messenger RNA to fight and make viruses and to fight for us, it hasn't been used in humans before. So that's where the controversy is, using part of the virus itself to inject in us to help us fight it. So that's that's where the controversy comes in. But we'll see. Moderna, this company, swears it's been working on something for over 10 years like that. But just the trials have been unsuccessful. What goes on in a mouse might not necessarily be able to be replicated in a human or a rhesus monkey or a macabre monkey, whatever. It may not uh, uh, be reflective of how it's going to work in a human. So you have to remember that a lot, a lot of animals carry uh, viruses in their skin and fur and stuff all the time, but they're fine with it. But once it gets on us or in us, then we're not, we don't respond the same way. So let's just look at mumps virus here. Mumps virus is also in the chick egg. Um, the polio virus was um, uh, grown in, um, um, grown in, um, in the monkey kidney and this one, the yellow fever virus is in also chicken embryo. So it looks like we use a lot of chicken embryos and monkey uh, kidney cells to get these viruses to become grown or grow and then attenuated, right? All right. So that is um, the big picture on that. Let me see if there was, uh, oh, Let's not forget about prions. Prions is something that I wanted you to um, know about. Um, prions are interesting in that they are just really proteins. <laughs> so these are infectious agents that are interesting because 
they're even they're 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 proteins. Um, they're infectious agents that do not even contain DNA or RNA. They consist just of proteins, and they can really have caused some diseases known as Creutzfeldt. Jacob disease, or CJD. CJD is a rapidly progressive uh, dementia, actually. Um, we see this with Kuru. I think I talked to you about the uh, in New Guinea, how some people would um, honor their dead by eating their brains, the dead brains, and then they would get this disease called Kuru, similar to like mad cow disease. Um, scrapies and sheep, you'll see this. So this same type of thing is what's going on with these prions infect infecting um, the brains. And there's no cure for this, actually. There's no cure for it that we know of. Okay, so let's look at this here. Um, DNA viruses, I want you to know they all replicate in the nucleus, uh, except for the pox virus. Pox virus does not replicate in the nucleus. Uh, RNA viruses all replicate in the cytoplasm, except for the influenza virus and retroviruses. So it's only a nucleus and a cytoplasm. So if you don't replicate in the nucleus, then it's going to replicate in the cytoplasm. If you don't replicate in the cytoplasm, you're going to replicate in the nucleus, okay? So live attenuated, you know that's the weakened virus. So I just want to go over the ones that are live but weakened. That's the MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. The Sabin polio um, vaccine. Uh, varicella zoster vaccine. Sometimes you could get those in the grocery stores, like in Kroger. I have seen them offer the varicella zoster vaccine. That is really the vaccine that will prevent shingles and chicken pox, right? Yellow fever, which we don't really see too much. We don't see that in this country. And then the smallpox vaccine was also live and attenuated, which was quite risky for its time. Uh, except for this one is pretty interesting in that this enslaved person's name is uh, Onesimus. He was an African um, person that was uh, an enslaved here in this country and he was in Boston at the time. Um, long story short, and this is how he introduced vaccinations to America, and his culture and where he was from, uh, whatever country he was from, probably off the uh, west coast of Africa, he and his people in his village had already been vaccinated against smallpox. So here in our country, you know, it was like wreaking havoc. And so he just kind of told the guy that purchased him, like, dude, uh, this is what we do in our, co our country or in my village, we just took a little bit of the pox, the little uh, little pustule part of it, broke it open, and then we just kind of took a knife and sc scraped some into our skin, and we just got some antibodies, and we were immune. And so this guy was like, what? So he's like, yeah, dude, that's all you got to do. You know, that's called an inoculation. This is a vaccine. You know, I don't know if they knew those words back then. Of course, they didn't because it was new to them, and let me make that point, wasn't new to Africans. So they, um, you know, yeah, the guy was like, I don't know about that. So anyway, they tried it and then it started, that whole vaccine thing just started, it caught on and saved lives. Like, um, we don't even vaccine against smallpox anymore because it's been eradicated from our world. As far as causing viruses, I think they're, as, as far as causing illness, but I think it's some still in vials. I don't know why humans hold on to it, but we do. And I have like a little scar where they mm, put this on. You can see, like check your grandmother or actually 
um, a person about my and my generation and you can look on their um, arm and you'll see that on their shoulder near their shoulder deltoid you'll see that they have a, like a little scar and you won't have one because um, they don't need to vaccine vaccinate against it anymore because it's been eradicated so that's just an interesting um, prelude into how vaccines really got started it was from uh, Africa Killed viruses, here's examples of killed viruses, rabies, of course you don't want to give even a weakened uh, vaccine of rabies because that is like 99.9% uh, fatal. Influenza vaccine, hepatitis A vaccine is a killed vaccine, and then SOC, another polio vaccine, this is the dude who came up with it, that K, I always remember the SOC and the K and killed. So these two, I remember that's a killed one. And then Sabin's polio vaccine is the weakened live one. So I just remember SOC, K for killed. Latent virus infections, um, virus, ex virus existed in the patients for months to years. These are latent, so they're not quite showing, they're not quite, um, uh, they're not exacerbated or anything. They're not coming up like, oh, yeah, we got this problem. No, these are latent. They're kind of dormant, quiet, and just waiting. So they could be there for years, months to years before it actually manifests as a clinical disease. We see this in SSPE. This is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. Um, and this is when a person's been probably infected with measles. This is a late sequela. Of measles. So, you know, we heard a sequence when you see a movie, the next sequence, sequence. Well, this uh, SSPE is a sequelae to measles. It's coming after the measles. Also, the interesting thing about measles is it's been given, uh, some researchers have started to say that measles is like a prelude to um, multiple sclerosis. And I see that this word subacute sclerosing is in here is laying dormant and it's uh, a late sequela of measles so then multiple sclerosis perhaps measles does this virus may have some implications in causing multiple sclerosis that has to be teased out and we'll have to do more research on that to actually prove that but a lot of uh, viruses do cause a whole gamut of uh, uh, diseases. Encephalitis, since I mentioned it here, let me just kind of uh, pan encephalitis. Let me just go over encephalitis. Um, it's an inflammation of the brain. You heard the itis at the end. And encephalae, uh, encephala means the head's head. So it's an inflammation of the brain and severity is variable. Some people do quite well with encephalitis, some people not so well. Symptoms can include headache, fever, confusion, stiff neck, vomiting, Kind of sounds like a meningitis, but usually um, it it's, uh, could be a little more daunting, I think. Complications are seizures, trouble speaking, memory problems, and problems hearing. Recovery can take weeks to months, right? Usually seen with herpes simplex can cause encephalitis. Um, West Nile, rabies, all the, the equine, uh, Western Eastern equine um, encephalitis can do that. The treatment, of course, will be with antiviral medications, anticonvulsants in case you're having the seizures. You have to just treat whatever it is that's going on. Um, to get the swelling down, you may want to get steroids, corticosteroids, and um, if the breathing actually becomes a big problem, you want to give um, artificial respiration, so I'll put them on a respirator. Um, that is really um, the gist of our miscellaneous uh, talk on viruses. And I want you to know that this will conclude um, the section on viruses. And we're going to have a little look into um, uh, the immune system. And I think we'll end it there. We'll look at some T cells and B cells because that's what these things are doing. They're kind of activating our immune system. So it will fight to help preserve our health. So the next time we talk, um, we will talk about the immune system. But as far as this is concerned, this concludes the lecture on viruses. 
few years ago, I was involved in a research program on a campus on the East Coast. Um, we scoured the campus and looked in all the landscape, looking, digging through soil to look for a virus. I happened to find one. Here's a bacteriophage, different shape than you normally see bacteriophages, but this is one I wanted to uh, share with you. I named it Halo Virus. If you look at it, look at the round head, it looks like a little clear circle around it. It reminded me of a halo. Um, I wanted to share this with you so that you would know that viruses are ubiquitous. Um, they're in the soil, they're on animals, and um, if we, uh, we need to make sure that we respect the territory and habitat of other animals because they indeed do have viruses that could uh, infect humans as we're living through now. So let me just share that with you.